Welcome to the Hockey Writers Maple Leafs Lounge, a weekly show from our Toronto Maple Leafs writing crew, bringing you the latest news, rumors, trades, player grades, prospects, and much more. From training camp to the playoffs, from draft day to the trade deadline, our team covers everything that happens with the blue and white. Come on in and pull up a chair. Welcome to the Maple Leafs Lounge. I'm going to steal a line from Bruce Buffer and the UFC. It's time. Yes, the NHL is back. The Maple Leafs are back after a four month and a couple week hiatus. And we are back. I am Kevin Armstrong, joined as always by my friends and the hockey writers colleagues, Peter Barracchini and Alex Hobson. We are all excited for this. And for all the Leafs fans who said they would never watch again, welcome back. Here it is. Here it is. So in October, the Leafs have nine regular season games and uh, we, we eliminate the preseason there. So we're going to first start about talking about your, the game you're most looking forward to at this point. And I am going to mark on my calendar and did as soon as it came out, October 25th. That is when the Leafs play the Carolina Hurricanes, and that's when they will face Mr. Frederick Anderson. And you may notice that I've I've changed my background, guys. I've I've had to I've had to remove the Anderson jersey. Uh, this is not being burned or anything stupid like uh, we saw. It's just going to go in the closet for a little while, along with uh, you know the Belfours and uh, and the other greats that have been there, but. Check this one out. It's being replaced with. Oh, all right. Can't go wrong. Don't Can't worry go about wrong. me. Yeah. Don't worry about me. So yes. What are you guys looking at for, uh, for your game out of the nine that are being played in October? Peter. I was just about to say Anderson's jerseys being retired to the closet for the time being. So, you know, it is what it is. We'll miss Freddie. Yeah. That's definitely a good game to look out for. I mean, he meant so much to the team. Um, I'm going to say right off the bat, back to back against Montreal and Ottawa, um, never rarely see a back to back situation early on the, or to start the season off. So you're going to be playing at home and then you're going to be playing in Ottawa. So obviously Montreal, it's going to be the nightmare that we've all witnessed in the past. We saw them against the preseason, but the roster is going to be completely different. No carry price. Um, given that he went on the player into the player assistance program, uh, still no Shea Weber. Um, I, I honestly, I look at back-to-backs very crucial, no matter what part of the season it is. So if they're able to get out the four points right off the bat, that's, that's going to be really great for them. Yeah. And you know, what's exciting about that is that we'll get to see Campbell and Mrazek in the first two days. So mm-hmm. I kind of like the back-to-back Alex, what are you looking at? Uh, game I'm looking forward to the most in the month of October is October 30th against the D- Detroit Red Wings, just for the sole purpose that I'm going to be at that game. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, my reasoning is a little bit selfish, but realistically, I mean, it will be the first Leaf game or first hockey game in general that I have been to since October 26th, 2019. And, you know, I went to a Jays game earlier on this summer when they, when they returned home and the atmosphere to be back at a Jays game was incredible. And obviously with the recent announcement that the Leafs are going to be allowing their fans in at a hundred percent capacity, I just can't wait to be back in that atmosphere again and be cheering on the boys in person. So. Awesome. Awesome. This is the Maple Leafs lounge brought to you by the hockey writers. Make sure you follow us on all your social media, follow Alex. He'll be uh, posting lots of, Pictures, I'm sure, from that night. Uh, we can't wait to watch and uh, see Alex at that game. All right, so we're obviously excited, but a little bit of uh, sad uh, news to start off uh, this day. We are recording on Sunday morning, and just a few hours ago, it uh, was revealed that Ilya Mikheyev is looking like a long-term injury uh, sustained during the Ottawa Senators' final preseason game there. We feel awful for the guy, um, but at the same time, this kind of came at uh, advantageous time for the Maple Leafs because it sounds like they were about to put Adam Brooks on waivers. I think he would have been taken during that. Um, now, Mikheyev goes on the the uh, long-term injury report, and you keep Brooks and 
we saw it during training camp. There's a lot of great uh, players that move around in there and, and try different things. So the roster looks good to me, even without Mikheyev at this point. Alex, what are you seeing with the roster? What are you seeing with the cuts that we saw as the week progressed? Um, I think, well, you're, you certainly raise a good point about the fact that while no one really wants to say it, Mikheyev being injured does make Sheldon Keefe's job a little bit easier in deciding who makes his final roster. Um, having said that, I just, I, I, I feel so bad for Mikheyev. I mean, the way he, the, his forearm injury back uh, in the 2019, 20 season kept him out for the entire season. He came back in 2021 and it wasn't really the same. And then this year, the news of the trade request comes out and everything. And all of a sudden he's got this great opportunity to slot into the top six. And I think he looked better in preseason than he did last year. And it was uh, looking like it was going to be a great, uh, a great opportunity for him to uh, maybe get some of his confidence back playing alongside some talented players. And unfortunately he's, he just, he just has the worst luck in the world. So it's uh, really, really unfortunate to see McKay go down like this. And I hope that he has a, sh- a short and quick recovery. Yeah. Peter, how does uh, Keith change the the look of the lineup with this injury? Oh, it's, I mean, you hate to say that it's a big hole to fill, but he is an important player to this team. I mean, he would obviously with the whole rumors of the whole wanting to trade out Keith and Dubas denying it, they say they have a place for him on the team and he came out flying out of the gate. You know, he looked good with Tavares and Nylander in the first few games that he played, scoring touches coming back. Seems like he was actually not just gunning for a third line spot, but for that, you know, second line left wing position. And he was making an impact for that. So that does put a damper in his game plans. Obviously, um, if the game plan was to have McKay there, you, you obviously have someone that could replace him in Michael Bunting. Um, you also have the possibility of playing Alexander Kerfoot, moving him up into the lineup as well. Um but yeah, and also it also gives more of an opportunity for a player like possibly a Kirill Semyonov, who looked just as impressive, to come into the lineup and possibly play. Obviously, won't be playing high up in the lineup, but in that fourth uh, fourth center, uh, fourth line position. So it, it, it's a it's a good it's a good situation for players that are still looking to like make a name for themselves and still battle and put their foot into the lineup. But for Mikheyev, like Alex said, it's it's just really bad luck considering how much he's taken towards improving his game, improving his offensive awareness. And it's honestly, we were obviously probably going to probably look at a career year for Mikheyev, more than 20 points, especially if he's going to be in the top six role. So a bit of 50-50 for both Keith and his game plan at this point. I would like to butt in real quick here and just say that with Mikheyev being out, now it seems more likely than ever that the top two left wingers to start the season are going to be Michael Bunsing and Nick Ritchie. Mm -hmm. And I think that makes McKay of situation a lot dicier by the time he comes back because McKay or uh, Bunsing and Ritchie both had very good preseasons in my eyes on their respective lines. And I think if they come out flying out of the gates and they play well and they prove that they can fit in those roles, it's going to be tough for McKay to take one of them out when he comes back. So we'll see how that situation plays out. Mm-hmm. And right from the start of training camp, uh, Bunting was beside Tavares quite a bit. Um, as training camp progressed, we saw Bunting play on a few different lines, but uh, it looked like that was always going to be the second option uh, in Keefe's size at this point. But uh, we wish the Cobra, as you guys all saw, the Cobra, we wish him the best. And uh, hopefully he gets back and we get to see him play later on in the season. Now, for our next subject, uh, you know, as as hard as it would be to put together the 12 forwards uh, on the defensive side of the puck, it wasn't as difficult as four slots were full. We already know the four slots are there. They're carrying over from last year, which was an incredibly improved defensive effort by the Maple Leafs. Uh, But they've got some holes in that bottom two pairing. And it looks like they're going to the farm system for it. We saw that early on. But who are we going with? How does that match up? I will say I thought it was funny when NHL 22 came out and Yaga is in the uh, top six for defensemen. Uh, I didn't see that one coming. But um, uh, who are you guys looking at? Uh, Peter, we'll start with you. Who are you putting into that uh, bottom two pairing? 
I mean, obviously on the left side, you're already looking at Rasmus Sandin. Um, he's taken big strides. His confidence is at an all-time high. He, him coming into the in and out of the lineup with Travis Dermott last year, it was looking dicey for him. He got sent down, brought back up, and, you know, played well. Uh, given that opportunity on the top pairing, we saw what he can do. So I think that left spot is his. Right spot is definitely going to come down to Dermott and Timothy Lilligren. Um Early on in the day, I remember seeing Keith said that, you know, Lilligren came in and he made his he made a statement. He proved that he belongs and he wanted to see more consistency out of Travis Dermott to battle it out and try and keep his spot in the lineup. And it's going to be a very interesting battle because there was a bit of a kind of a battle on Leafs Twitter right now saying, oh, you know, why would you play Lilligren when Dermott has more experience? And I get that. But at the same time, if you're looking at based on preseason, Lilligren looked far better than Dermott. And I honestly think that it's possible that he could be in the starting lineup with Sandine and him and Sandine have had really great chemistry with their time in the Marley. So there's that familiarity. His confidence is at an all-time high and he, he made a lasting impression. So I think he, Timothy Lilligren could possibly bump Travis Dermott down. All right. Are you in the same boat, Alex? Yeah, I am. Um, and the tough part about Timothy Lilligren is that we're kind of reaching a point with him where it's like, if we're not going to get him into regular minutes in the NHL, um, you should just trade him because he's at the point now where he's proven that he's been, he's good enough to play in the NHL. He's proven that he's outgrown the AHL. And I think what we're going to see to start the season is, I don't know if you guys recall last season when at the start of the year, it almost seemed like there was a little bit of a rotation going on between Travis Dermott, Miko Lettinen and mm-hmm. Zach Bogosian. Obviously, Bogosian established very early on that he was going to be a mainstay in the lineup, and then it didn't take long for Travis Dermott to outplay Miko Lettinen for a spot in the lineup. And I think we're going to see something similar like that this year between Dermott and Lilligren, uh, just battling it out, taking turns for that last spot, because obviously... Justin Hall, as much as he struggled when he's not playing with Muzzin, I think the Leafs envision Justin Hall and Jake Muzzin being that second pairing. Um, I think Rasmus Sandin has played himself onto the team permanently. I don't see a scenario where he goes down to the Marlies or sits. And so that leaves the last two spots to Dermot and Lilligren. And I think Travis Dermot, just because he's got the, he's got more experience. And for the record, I still do think that he is a fine bottom six or bottom pairing defenseman. I think he could fit that role well on many teams, but I don't think he's going to have much of a long leash because if Timothy Lilligren comes in and he outplays Dermot at that point, you got to worry about putting the best player on the ice. And uh, I don't think they're going to maintain that loyalty to Dermot just because of his experience when you've got someone who's ready to take a spot. So I think we're going to see a real battle between those two guys. The other important part of this is, uh, and I hate to look past this season, but Morgan Riley's in his last year. And uh, we've kind of identified, Alex, you identified early last season that uh, Rasmus Sandin was kind of building into the next Morgan Riley. If the Leafs cannot find a way to keep Morgan Riley, which I still, I don't know how they do, but right there, you've got to start playing Sandine with some big minutes because he, he very good possibility. He's in your top four, possibly your top two next year. And uh, if Morgan Riley doesn't resign and I'll also agree with Lilligren, I'm to the point where if he can't make it, I I almost think it's kind of a mercy trade to get him out and see what he can do with a different organization at this point. And there's lots of guys that are in other organizations that look good at one point in their career, but haven't cracked. And they would be, you know, they find those guys, Kyle Dubas can find those guys that uh, just haven't made it with another team and, and try to, try to save two careers at the same time with trading Lilligren. Cause remember this guy was a first round draft pick right yeah. after uh, the Matthews year. So he's got big shoes and he's not really performed at all. So yeah, this he was projected it. to be a top five pick at one point. Yeah. That was obviously even. before that. Yeah. It was before he got mono, yeah. but he was supposed to be second fiddle to Nolan Patrick that year. Mm-hmm. So wow. the, the, the skill is clearly there. It's just a matter of whether or not the Leafs can give him consistent enough minutes to allow him to prove that he's ready to play in the NHL. Cause like I said, the skills there, I don't think there's any question about that, but he's got to get some regular minutes. I, I, I don't really want to see him in a role this year where he's sort of flip-flopping between sitting on the bench and maybe getting eight minutes a game or something. We've got to give him a real opportunity. And I think the fact that the, he, they took the time to round out his game because they saw more than just a puck moving defenseman. They saw someone with potential on both sides of the puck 
And we're seeing that payoff right now. It took a little bit of time, but we're seeing possibly the finished product with Lilligren right now. This is the Maple Leafs Lounge brought to you by the Hockey Writers. If you're liking what you're hearing, liking what you're seeing, please like and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Leave all your comments below and uh, we will get to those as we go. Now, speaking of comments, uh, there's one thing that is that is exhausting uh, following this, this team, and it's um, the regurgitated chirps and... When you've got a team that you cover and you've followed for so long, it's a hundred plus years of history. There's a lot of stuff that can be said, but chirps need to be creative people. I cannot stand seeing the 1967 comment. It's just lazy. Okay, come on. You got to do more than that. You got to show up and, and put some effort into this 1967. When the simple fact is, uh, anyone other than the Tampa Bay Lightning, you can throw out a year chirp too. It doesn't matter when the last time a, a team won the Stanley Cup. It's the last team that won that's the only one that uh, can defend on that, and that's the only one that matters at that point. It's a big, it's a big league. 1967 is the most – it's just lame. It's come on, do better. Do better, chirps. And uh, anyway, this is, this is getting into – uh, where I'm going with an article that I really want your guys help with uh, the lame, the lazy, the annoying chirps that we hear from non leaf fans and some trolls, not, not, not everyone's a troll that chirps, but you know what I'm saying? So uh, what do you guys hear? What are the lazy lame ones that people need to do better? If you're really going to come after Maple Leafs fans, you got to do better. So Alex, what, what's your uh, chirp that you hear the most that's got to get rid of? I mean, I get a comment under every single article I write that says 1967. So I'd, <laughs> I'd probably agree with you in that sense. But um, I don't know. Aside from that, I mean, it's just the, the, the classic first round jokes and the ones about, how, you know, not winning a playoff series since 2004. To be completely honest, all I have to say is that this hockey team has hurt me more than any troll could with words. So I'll leave it at that. That's the thing. That's why I really do think you got to bring more because you're not telling a Maple Leaf fan anything they don't already know. And that they haven't heard several times. If somebody says 1967, I was like, it's more a reflection of your terrible chirping than, than the, the franchise and what the fan base has had to go through. Peter, how about you? Yeah, like Alex, I, I just posted an article about talking about the Maple Leafs power play. And then the first comment, 1967. So I'm just like, you know what? I'm not even going to bother because, it, 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 like you said, it's lazy. It's not even original any, anymore. We know the last time our team last won a championship. We don't need a constant reminder. Yeah, we know we've had our issues in the past. Get over it. Find something new. Um, for me, it is the comparisons of, like, their last playoff win and then this happened – then the Maple Leafs last won a playoff series or all this has happened since the Maple Leafs last made the playoffs and all that. And especially for the playoff series win from 2003 or four, I was still in elementary school at that time. So that is a long time. And every single time I hear a comparison to that, it, it's, it's great, but it's also makes me feel so old that I'm like, man, something needs to change. Cause it's like pushing on 20 years to say last possibly won a Stanley or not Stanley cup, a playoff series at this point. So, yeah, it, 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 to me, the comparisons are more original than just those like simple one line chirps. I actually like, though, the year thing, because when you look back and uh, it's like there was no iPhone, there was no uh, yeah. Facebook, there was no like all mm -hmm. these things that uh, have come since then that you don't even think of that were were around. Um, one that I find it's kind of difficult because I really love. The Zamboni driver story. That is one of the most classic NHL stories of all time. And it sucks that it happened to the Toronto Maple Leafs. But uh, you know what? And whenever anyone says, you guys lost to a Zamboni driver, I'm like, that's such a cool story, though. <laughs> you know, when the movie yes. does come out, it's going to be against the big, mean, tough Maple Leafs that have all these scores and this Zamboni driver comes off the bench. It's going to be great. They're going to look great uh, until they lose. But 
uh, I I kind of like that chirp a little bit, but it, and it doesn't sting. So, mm. any other uh, any other creative chirps out there? I will add that Steve Dangle in his video following that loss to David Ayers was probably the most famous video and most famous line that anybody has been saying since then. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll, uh, we'll end off here with a few viewer comments on the last YouTube, a uh, little bit of a drop off of views on this one, but we think it may have been because the blue Jays and what a run they gave Toronto fans, Canada fans, uh, and just falling one short. They all count. It's crazy that there's 162 games and it comes down to that final afternoon where four teams are, are playing it for, for the end. Anyway, uh, hey, we got a nice one from Stephen Kohler. Thanks for the show. Got to admit, Dubas has provided some players, some players with solid immediate potential. I think we touched on that earlier on. Uh, it looks like in the top six, there's going to be two new players that are going to definitely hold their own with uh, Richie and Bunting. So thank you very much for that. I think that might be our first fan. That's I was first literally fan. just going to say, I don't believe that we got a comment from someone who likes Kyle Dubas. Yeah. 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 Right. That, that never happens. <laughs> And that's uh, that's why we get sometimes labeled with Dubas defenders. But I think we're just trying to show the other side. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think you guys might be Dubas defenders, actually. There you go. There. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Noted Steve. Dubas defender. I'm okay with that. Yeah. No problem. Steve Thomas, which I'm pretty sure is probably not the Steve Thomas that played for the Leafs in the 90s. Um, he's not watching our videos. I would hope Maybe. that he is. That would be awesome. <laughs> um now it says here uh what is your thoughts on the comment that dubas gave a contract to his buddy keith to avoid distraction but not the number one d-man morgan riley um I, i i think that maybe because of the fact that player player negotiations are a bit more complicated than it is with the coaching staff or like personnel. You can easily get that out of the way and knowing Sheldon Keith, I mean, Dubas and Keith and their relationship and the success that they've had, you could easily try and give him a two year deal to try and say, Hey, listen, I know the last two years have been, you know, up and down given the fact that I've had a winning record, given the fact that you haven't played a full season, two years to show me what you can do after that, you can try and get something long-term at a five-year deal you need to find more success because Keith, I'll bite a short sample size. Keith has been successful. You just want to see more of Morgan Riley is a different situation. Players, sometimes they just don't want to negotiate at the beginning or during the season. However, something does come up mid season and they have a deal in place. They could either sign kind of like what Austin Matthews did mid season or just wait to put pen to paper at the end of the year. So I think it's, it's more, it's more of an issue with players because you have to worry about, the, the market itself based on what we've seen with other, other defensemen with what he wants long-term does he want more years does he want more money so I think a lot of factors are coming more into effect for that than it is a coaching staff where you have key sample is much more smaller compared to that of Morgan Riley so I think you wanted to get the head coach down longer worry about the defender later on if you still can't do something about that I I, I it's going to be really difficult because you're going to have another free agent leave for nothing if nothing comes to fruition yeah, and the other thing is, I, I would respectfully say it's comparing apples to oranges. There's no salary cap when it comes yeah. to coaching and everybody else in the organization, um, but there's a pretty big barricade when it comes to player salary caps, and uh, and so that's that's one of the reasons. I'm sure they would love to say Morgan Riley's here and here's his extension and here's all the money that yeah. he wants, but unfortunately, that would put them about four to five million dollars over the cap right now um so that that's not going to work um so let's see uh i'm just checking out the article that uh that we had up on the on the last lounge as well to see and you know there's a lot of people that love hosang um and they they were liking what we were saying about hosang and uh and 
where he's been going and his, his passion and his heart that he's put out on the ice every time he did get that NHL contract. So congrats, the AHL contract, I should say. So congratulations to that. He's on his way back. Keith did say that uh, there's still some things he needs to work on and that's why he's assigned to the Marlies, but I think he could make it back to the Maple Leafs here. Um, Maybe not this year, but uh, in the future, uh, Alex, you've been kind of a fan of, of Hosang since they signed that PTO. Um, any thoughts on him being reassigned and where he's going now? Yeah, I'm actually going to take things a step further here, Kevin. I don't think, uh, I don't think it's going to be a year before we see Hosang. I think he has potential to be the next guy called up with an injury. I think the only reason that they signed him to an AHL contract was that so that he didn't take up a spot on the roster. And now they don't have to worry about waivers. They don't have to worry about sending him down. Cause I believe that would have been an issue if they did sign him to an NHL contract, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they would have had to put him on waivers to send him to the AHL. So I like the fact that they signed him to an AHL deal. And now he gets to start the season playing alongside of, I believe it's Nick Robertson and uh, Simeon Duragachinsev. So that is going to be, he's going to be firing, you know, well, not firing bullets. I guess that'll be Robertson firing bullets, but he'll be the one providing Robertson with the bullets, if that makes any sense. So, um, yeah, I think he's got a great opportunity to really work on his game down there and round it out. And then I think into November, December, if some, if someone on the forward core, obviously other than McKayev gets injured, I think he could be the first guy called up. And I think at that point, the Leafs would sign him to an NHL contract and they'd be able to send him, send him up and, uh, so, sorry, send them down and call them up kind of as they please. But I think we're going to get a look at them sooner rather than later. Hmm. Peter, do you agree with that one? Absolutely. And I kind of, kind of similar path to what um, happened with Alex Galchenyuk last year, you know, you acquire him, send him down, let him round out his game. He, like Alex mentioned, he's going to be playing with SDA and Robertson. All three have been, had very good glimpses in the preseason Hosang kind of be more of that playmaker uh, kind of player. Arga Chinsev is shooting the puck a lot more. Nick Robertson, we've seen what we've done. So the fact that he's playing already top six minutes or going to be playing top six minutes in the AHL is going to go well for him. He rounds out his game defensively. I think you have some idea of where he's going to be at in the NHL. He has the experience. He just wanted an opportunity, and he's got that. So I think now if they were able to uh, make the reclamation project of Alex Galchenyuk, they already have a blueprint on how to do that with Josh Hosang. And I think it's going to happen probably like Alex sooner than later. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like him, but I, I think I'm thinking Robertson before that. I, to me, I was actually surprised when Robertson went down because that kid was just all over the ice mm-hmm. uh, in, in the preseason games. And, and he had that development camp where he had to kind of be reined in because he was all over the ice so much, but um Robertson and it also goes to show how far the Leafs have come in the last couple of seasons because Robertson got went from junior and got inserted right in, into the play-in series against Columbus now he can't make the team so um, a lot of skill showing up for the Maple Leafs in different areas as the season progresses one last thing uh, and this kind of goes back to how we started the show uh, rides hog one one two zero He says, the fan base doesn't deserve a winning team. Y'all don't have a clue about the game of hockey, and even more pathetic is the fact that not one of y'all has a clue what a real fan is supposed to act like. You get it. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's very colorful. Uh, You should should check it out. Rides Hog 1120 is basically saying to all those fans that uh, turned on this team and made it a awful presence on social media burning jerseys saying all these horrible things doing all those things for the last uh four months um welcome back the Leafs are still here the players still want to win and uh we still want to cover them and and be on this great ride along with this franchise this historic franchise that again has a chance to uh to rewrite the record books here and uh rides hog i think kind of hit it on the head there with with uh the fan base needs to show up and and stop being so there's plenty of colorful words i can say there but uh support them this is a great game this is a great team and the only way that they're going to stay together here is if uh, they feel the love from the fan base because there's lots of other teams that would love to have these guys 
And uh, if you're not showing them the love and the reason to stay in Toronto, then they'll just be gone. And then what do you do when the team's just making the playoffs or not making the playoffs? Maybe you watch them. Maybe you don't. I can't miss a game right now. They're so great to watch. So final words, guys. I was just about to say, I was a little bit confused with the direction that was going. I'm like, is this just a really bad comment saying that all the fan base is bad or just a select number of few? So, yeah, you do have the bad apples that just bash nonstop. And you know what? For every bad apple or every fan that's just always negative, you always have like 15, 20 plus fans that are always positive and are always going to going to support the team no matter what. And yeah, you, there's, a, there's a fine line between crossing the line and being critical. You can't be critical and still like the team, which is what we do on a daily basis. We love the team, but we still give our critiques and our, our takes, whether it's good or bad. But if there are fans that are just, like you said, burning jerseys, just constantly berating players, social media accounts, or just negative comments, then yeah, that's, that's absolutely disgusting. So yeah, you know, I, I mean someone needed to say it we all we all feel the same way the fan base is loyal the fan base is you know in it for the long run no matter what but to those that are still bashing the team well yeah (laughs) what else can you say yeah well and as uh it's been pointed out by dubas usually the guys that are saying the worst become the biggest boosters as soon as things turn around so um alex any final comments on this one no, I, you know what? I could sit here and ramble for two minutes, but you and Peter basically covered any point. So I'll leave it at that. See, Alex always has just the best things to say, and he's <laughs> going to make us wait until next week to hear the best. No, things well, to say. The, well, the best thing that I have to say is pretty much exactly what you guys said, because I just be repeating what you said. So you should take yeah. that as a compliment. Hey, we will look at all these there compliments. Go. We got our first yeah. fan. Alex is complimenting mm. us. It's been quite there a week. You go. You know, the start of the season is around the corner when everyone's positive. (laughs) All right. Thanks so much for joining us for this edition of the Maple Leafs Lounge. We will see you in one week's time where we will have plenty of regular season action to uh, decipher. And you you never know what's going to happen in the hockey world. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week.